Network to the world. Subscribe now to the Hot 97 YouTube channel. It's Ebro in the Morning with Laura Stiles and Rosenberg. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's Ebro, Laura, and Rosenberg. What's poppin'? And today's guest running for mayor of New York City. Her name, Maya Wiley. Good morning, Maya Wiley. How are you? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm wonderful because I'm here. Now, um, before we get off into your, your backstory uh, as a civil rights activist, a professor at the New School, a lawyer, et cetera, et cetera, um, you're a New Yorker, yes? You're from New York. I was born in Syracuse, spent first year and a half of uh, my little babyhood on the Lower East Side, and grew up in Washington, D.C., came back to New York as soon as I could. There it is. And How so- old were you when you came back? I went. I came back for graduate school, so I was twenty-two. Nice. Um, you also worked for De Blasio, correct? I did. I joined the De Blasio administration at the beginning in twenty fourteen, and I left in twenty sixteen. But chaired the New York City Civilian Complaint Review Board on police misconduct after I left. Oh, wow. You shared that because we are uh, actually recently just had a conversation with this new uh, transparency statute 50A and the, and the release of these yep. documents on police behavior. We've been having conversations because I don't think regular New Yorkers even know who to speak to or how to find the people from this civilian complaint review board. Well, you know, here's the thing. Uh, There is a database and the Civilian Complaint Review Board has a website. So if you just put in New York City Civilian Complaint Review Board or CCRB, you will get that site. But you're right. The database is supposed to be publicly available. Um, and it, and just regular people that go through things with the NYPD, they can they can just make a complaint directly to the review board. Yes, but here's the thing, Ebro, that I want everyone to understand. You don't have to be the victim to make a complaint. Mm. You could be a witness. So if you see something go down, you can complain about what you saw, even though you were not the person hurt. And that is critically important because we spent a lot of time trying to make sure Uh, we were getting that information out to the public because, as Mm. you know, that's everything like you, 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 even if you see a videotape of an incident on Twitter, you are a witness because Mm. of the videotape you saw. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think that's common knowledge. Now, how, what are the politics and, and, you know, because you're running for mayor, what, how are... How are these things not more readily known? Why is it more marketing dollars put into making this more more of a, a known thing? And I always feel like, you know, the NYPD's union and their power and their the money they have to coerce the public and be on 1010 wins and the cover of the post and everything. Politicians often are, are very afraid of, you know, having a public back and forth with the police or trying to help civilians. Yeah, you know, you're right about resources and that we needed more money Uh, at the CCRB. I will say, thankfully, because of the city council and the de Blasio administration, CCRB did get more resources for public education because it didn't really have much of a unit to do that. And so we built it. In fact, I brought in and created a senior position in the top of the agency to focus on communications, public education and advocacy so we could strengthen the work. And we took our meetings out into community and really went to every single borough, sat in the neighborhood that had the precincts with the highest number of complaints. And we had the precinct commander come and we organized community leaders to come because a lot of the problem is people are afraid. People are afraid of retaliation. Mm -hmm. Uh, So we had and invited community leaders to speak about what they were hearing, right? Rather than to put people in a position where they might have, that they might not feel comfortable with because they were afraid of what what might happen if they did speak. So we did everything we could to at least elevate the issues. Uh, but, But I think that's a big part of the problem is people are afraid and we have to fix that. 
And a big part of how we fit, have to fix that, which I will do as mayor, is we will have the public determine the rules of the road. Because a big thing that people don't realize about police misconduct is there's a lot of conduct that is gray area, where the patrol guy doesn't say clearly, you can do this, you cannot do that. And when we're clearer about what the rules of the road are, if you go off-roading, it's easier to hold folks accountable, but it's also easier to prevent the misconduct in the first place because mm. you've been very clear about what will get you in trouble. Right now, that's that could be clearer than it is, and that would prevent misconduct. And the other thing we have to talk about, and I will do, is we have to put more resources into the community. Our communities are traumatized. Our communities have the highest rates of, of drop job loss, mm -hmm. not just in this pandemic, even before the pandemic, and highest rates of evic eviction and hunger. So unless we're actually starting to solve those problems, which I will do as mayor, we're also creating the conditions where we're, where we're constantly calling the police rather than a mental health expert, or we're calling the police rather than educators who can better support after school programs in mm -hmm. our communities, or we're calling the police rather than ensuring that people have a safe place to live in decent housing. And we have to solve those things and ensure that our youth get summer jobs and so much more. And that's what my gun violence prevention plan, point, a plan calls for. And that's what we need to do. So now, it sounds like you stand with defunding the police. I stand very much with, we have a bloated police department. We okay. have been growing the size of the police department every single year, despite historically low crime rates. And if you look at what we're calling police to do, we're calling them to do somebody at what should be somebody else's job. And all you have to do is think about the folks who are dead today because they had a mental health breakdown yeah. or because they were in a car without a seatbelt. <laughs> And rather than recognizing that there are other ways of handling those things and having a badge and a gun, we're going to continue to see in our communities violence we can prevent. Uh, so I'm absolutely, and I've said we will take $18 million from the police department budget and create a participatory justice fund in communities that have high rates of crime. Participatory justice fund, that means community members get to say where public dollars go mm. because it is the it is our communities that know best what they need. So some communities have violence interruption, but maybe they don't have an after school program. Some communities have an after school program, but maybe they don't have counselors in the school building. That's the other thing. We got to put trauma informed care inside our schools because our kids are traumatized. So we'll do that as well, but we'll also give communities more dollars they can direct because they know what they need. And that's being a very different kind of government that's much more responsive to the investments our communities need. But it also sounds like a people first uh, type of government, which it always feels like the business community and the people first kind of energy that some uh, de Blasio has tried. There's always a, a rub there. There's always a disconnect where it feels like these, you know, not just the billionaires, but even some of the small business owners who just want to have more police on the street is the answer so that there's less crime so that I can make my money doing business. How do you balance that out with that business community? Yeah, you know, I've been having a lot of these conversations, both with uh, wealthy folks and small business owners and, and frankly, regular folks in our community, my own friend lost his nephew in October at 4.30 p.m. in Central Brooklyn in Bed-Stuy, just going to the corner store, shot dead, 22 years old. This is affecting us at a very personal level. This is not theoretical. Uh, but when you look at the problem, what we all agree on is we want to solve the problem. So the question isn't whether or not we have policing, it's what are they supposed to do? And what they're supposed to do is keep illegal guns out of the city and out of our communities. That's a function for policing we all agree on. What they shouldn't be doing is simply throwing kids up against a fence. That's not oh. policing. That's not safety. And so what we so when I have the conversation about let's talk about what the job is 
and what the job isn't. Because when we do that, there's a lot of agreement that it makes more sense to invest in solving problems and ensure that the policing is focused on the, the job of policing. And that's not what's happening right now. What do you think about uh, Andrew Yang, who currently is polling at like 37 percent, Eric Adams after that at 19, and then you in, in third as of right now? What do you think of Yang as a candidate for New York? So the, I, I'll be honest, the way I think of it is it's a wonderful thing for our democracy that there's so many of us running from so many different backgrounds and experiences, because that's what it's all about. We have to have people in office who know, understand and have experienced what our people are living through. And I, you know, I, I grew up as the child of civil rights activists. <laughs> I went to a neighborhood public school that was all black, underfunded, overcrowded teachers who were stressed and struggling. Uh, we didn't have a patch of grass. We ran the streets because that's where you played. I got more scars and stitches than uh, my mother used to say, can you please fall on something other than your face? <laughs> uh, but, but this is the thing. Uh, these are the experiences. So it's good that we have people in the race with multiple experiences. The question is, what are we going to do? And I have a plan because I'm the only candidate in this race who has not only been a change maker for our communities for 30 years as a civil rights lawyer and racial justice advocate, but that has done it from everything from litigating, lobbying, but also senior levels in that hot kitchen, because it gets hot up in that kitchen, in that hot kitchen called City Hall, who knows what it means to manage 55 agencies that's covering 330 square miles, but needs to pay more attention to meeting the needs of our communities and understanding what they are, which is part of why I've got a plan to create 100,000 new jobs by spending $10 billion in capital construction. That just means the part of the budget mm -hmm. that I can direct as mayor without agreement from <clears throat> Albany or dollar from DC, because I know how it works. And what that means is then I also know that one of the things we can do with that budget is solve the problems our communities have. So in addition to the 100,000 new jobs, which we can do local targeted hiring for, ensure we're getting more of our folks who need those jobs into that job pipeline, that we solve other problems community has. Like capital construction, that means we can build more affordable housing. Capital construction, that means I got $2 billion earmarked now, right now, I could be spending on renovating and rehabilitation, rehabilitating NYCHA, because we don't have to wait for Albany or the federal government to be doing more right now with what we have if we're focused on what we have and how to deploy it to the communities that need it. And I think that's what I bring and what I focus on, frankly, is being very clear what I will do as mayor and why I'm going to deliver for the city, but for our folks who really desperately need it. I got to say, Maya, you did a great job uh, basically um not answering Rosenberg's question, but also focusing <laughs> on you. And it was a phenomenal answer. Um, but the one thing. It's, the all, one, it's, it's, all, it's all about making sure people know what you will do. That's right. That's what well, it's but, now, yeah, yeah, facts. but how come these yeah. things haven't happened in the past? Okay. What is the real answer? We have heard about NYCHA being improved for generations. We've heard about city hospitals being improved for generations. The unemployment problem continues to be a problem. So there's something missing. Is it the training for these jobs? Like who who will these at jobs actually go to? Or will they be contracted yeah. out to the same people who get all the contracts and the unions that get all the work, and then there'll still be people left behind? What is the missing element here that you yeah. bring to the table that can fix problems that have been talked about, uh, you know, election cycle after election cycle after election cycle? Uh, knowing how it works and why it doesn't reach our communities so we can flip the script. So let me give you an example. When I was in City Hall, I was responsible for women and minority-owned business contracting. Now we know, I, I was someone who grew up in a house after my father died. My mother made money and helped keep a roof over her head because she was getting government contracts to do affirmative action policy, right? Uh, till the rug got pulled out from under that. But I say that because it is a way that we generate jobs and, and money into our communities. 
uh, we had to get those numbers up. It was $500 million when I came into City Hall uh, and the mayor asked me to direct that program. There was, it was a program with no staff, no resources, and, it was, and, and we had to get those numbers up. Mm. So I started participating in negotiating what we call a project labor agreement with the building trades. Project labor agreement is about work you guarantee to, to, for union jobs and work the city is paying for and getting done. But what we did in those negotiations is we increased dramatically the number a uh, percentage of those that wouldn't be subject to it that we could direct directly to women and minority owned businesses so that that could get our spend up we got our spend up from 500 million to 1.6 billion in one year uh, because i led that non-existent program <laughs> but just pulling on the levers of what we've got to get it done but the opportunity we have now one real attention to locally based hiring I'm a lawyer, we looked at it closely. My plan I can accomplish to ensure that we can get neighborhoods more jobs. But it's also because the unions have done a good thing that has produced for our people. We need to expand these programs, but the pre-apprenticeship and apprenticeship programs. Right. So for kids graduating from New York City public high schools, these are the kids you know, we've got to get jobs for who often don't, don't, don't get enough of a career ladder. These are good jobs. There's one research study that shows coming out of high school, uh, kids in these programs were earning $62,500 a year. Mm. And so building that and that partnership with the union that builds into, and the unions recognize they got to diversify. The other thing is our laborers are very diverse and do recognize a lot of our folks that live right here in the city. So these are jobs we can build, absolutely. But the other thing you're pointing to and we have to get much smarter about as a city is how we're spending our workforce development dollars mm -hmm. because we need to be right now there are a whole bunch of different little pots all over the city and we're not strategically aligning them better and focusing them where we need to focus the most and in partnership with the private sector so that we're also leaning into where the jobs are growing but we're also doing it in a way that focuses where people need the job the most. And let's just talk about COVID because it is black women and Latinas, 80% of women who work in care work, right? Taking care of children, cleaning homes, taking care of the elderly that have lost jobs. Well, we have to use our city resources to solve that. And that's what I've proposed also with my universal care plan. But if, you, if, you're, if you're listening, the primary difference is I'm saying, I know where the money is. That's right. I know how to fix how it's being spent. And I know how to do it in a way that focuses on our communities because that's what I've focused on my whole life. Well, you know, I will say of all the candidates we've had on the show and we've had now, what, five guys? 500, it feels like. <laughs> um, no, yeah, we Maya's four. given us the most yeah. detail as yeah. far mm -hmm. as where the money is and, and, and how it can be moved around. Now, obviously, you know, Maya, you get the job and then you go in there and you actually have to bring it to life. And there's a bureaucracy and, you know, politics that always stand in the way of that and, you know, deals that need to get done. But one thing I always ask mayor candidates and other people who come on this program um, how are you going to address the white supremacists that work inside the NYPD? Well, this is the Ebro special open, right here. Hold these open racists accountable mm -hmm. for their behavior. We have a police department union that openly endorsed a president that was, um, you know, overtly white supremacist mm -hmm. uh, in things not only that he said, but some of his policy and the people we put around him. So, you know, that's a that's something that, you know, I would love to hear addressed openly because I feel like too many people skirt around uh, going at this head on. And we continue to see video of police antagonizing activists, throwing up hand signs, saying things, et cetera, et cetera. I'm running for mayor because what we need is a leader who is not looking to be a politician but looking to protect and serve the people. And what that means is willing to fight for what's right without concern to future jobs, <laughs> right? Only about what we deliver. Because the only thing that stands between us and police department that actually protects and serves is the will to say, no, you don't. No, you don't get to. 
And what you're describing is fundamentally about how we shift both what the job is, how we hold folks accountable. And yeah, you are not qualified to protect and serve New Yorkers if you do not believe we all deserve protection and service. And that's a job qualification. And a job qualification means if you've demonstrated you can't do the job, you lose it. Well, saying in a city that is two thirds black, Latino, Asian, Native American, that there are people who are less than deserving means you don't deserve the job. You are unqualified for it and you lose it, period, period, period. And, you, and as mayor, you will have that power or will the union be standing yeah, in you said, that, Well, the union will fight. The union will fight, but the union's not the decision maker. So How do my you, point is, the you. Mm-hmm. I, I'm sorry, Ma, I was going to say, in, in, in answering that, how do you avoid some of the pitfalls that our friend of the show and, and your friend Mayor de Blasio fell into where it seems like he, he tried to hold a strong position with the police, he got a bit bullied by them, got, his, got they turned their back on him, and he really was never able to regain footing as being either for the police or sort of for the people, and he got sort of stuck in a situation where he wasn't respected fully by either side. Well, let me be, yeah, Im- important question. Let me be clear. If I was mayor and the police turned their back on me, do you know what my response would be? It's your Love First Amendment it. right. Your, your First Amendment right has nothing to do with my decision making. Nothing. There's no reason why anyone should be bullied by that, number one. But number two, you know, a big part of it is also how we manage the police department as a place of work. Because the thing I also know about being inside City Hall and talking to a lot of police officers, uh, many of whom I became friends with, some of whom I stay in touch with, I will tell you right now, a lot of them feel abused by what happens inside the department and by the folks that are a a smaller percentage who are vocal in the union and that's an opportunity to recognize we're not at war with our own police department we are at war with some of the folks inside it who aren't doing the right thing and putting the right police commissioner there who is on mission who does not just come up from the rank and file and who understands the mission and is and and will be held accountable by me as mayor to deliver on the internal management of the department is a really big part of it and it's the part that is not visible to the public because it is about the internal management of the agency. But what it really requires is having the right person in that job who's on mission, who's on accountable, who's accountable and who understands who that person serves. And it's the mayor of the city of New York elected by the people to deliver the changes in the department that have to happen. And a lot of it is management changes. So the union can stomp and scream. That's what they're there for. And where they have legitimate complaints about safety or or job benefits or things that any union has absolute right to to complain about or negotiate for, absolutely, that's a legitimate role of unions. Where you're just demanding the power to hurt people, then you just don't get a hearing. Now, uh, Maya, would you um, have a commissioner of the police department um, that comes from the rank and file that came up through the system or a civilian commissioner? I would not have someone, and I've been public and explicit about this, I'm not going to have someone who's come up through the rank and file because it's a big part of what we have to change. And so, yes, I'm actively actively thinking about where and how we find the right civilian <laughs> because the, what we need is someone who understands the reforms that are necessary, both in terms of right-sizing the department, recognizing its appropriate role, and being a partner with people in community around what problems have to be solved that are appropriate for police and what aren't. And my job as mayor is to hold that person accountable to that 
but also make sure that communities are participating and have a real voice and role in defining that because our communities deserve a say. They're not saying we want no police. What they're saying is we want to be safe in our streets from crime and we want to be safe in our streets from police violence. Uh, and here's the other thing we have to do. So a lot of problems and fears right now, in addition to gun violence, which I've spoken to a bit, that we can change and prevent uh, by investing in community. But the other piece is street homelessness. You know, the street homeless represent both the evicted, because that's what homelessness is, is an eviction crisis, an affordability crisis, but it's also a mental health crisis and a failure to invest in mental health services that help people stay in housing, that help people get jobs or stay employed or, or manage their lives. And we have the ability in city government right now, rather than spending $3 billion to put people into a congregate shelter that they're afraid to be in, that they leave, that they avoid, that they'd rather ride the subways than be in, when they have mental health issues that they need treated, they have addiction issues that they need treated, we have the ability to use those dollars instead to put them directly into housing that have services in them services. That's a different way of looking at public safety, right? Because one of the things we're seeing in the news over and over again, and it's terrifying, and it's heartbreaking, and it's outrageous, is we have people who are mentally ill who then commit an act of violence. Well, we know that violence can be prevented if we have them getting appropriate treatment, medications, and in supportive housing that is on-site services. And the research is clear. We just have to have the will to change the way we're spending the dollars and recognizing, you know, we more policing doesn't end the problem of people who are mentally ill who deserve to be That's in right. homes, but we can end that problem. And that reduces the need for that policing. And so we can get policing focused on the illegal guns that are coming into our city and our, in our communities, which we desperately need them focused on. I think Pee Wee agrees. <clears throat> that oh, that was Pee Wee. That was Pee Wee, Laura. Yes, Pee yes, yes. Pee Wee. Pee -wee as soon as you started registered. talking about homelessness, Maya, you know that's a topic that is 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 near and dear to our hearts on this program. And very, uh, Laura Styles is very passionate about uh, talking about homelessness. Her dog Pee Wee heard you bring that up, and he loved your plan. He's co-signing you. <laughs> I just want to know if Pee Wee is registered. That's that's what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Maya, do you have a dog? Do you have any pets? I got, I got, we got cats. We got, I've lost track of the count because we, we, but we're, we're, we've got three cats now and a lizard. And oh, I, the only wow. reason we have a lizard, I want to be very clear. I was an absolute no to anything reptilian. Mm -hmm. And my daughter asked for a snake. And I said, Absolutely oh, heck no. Nah. Oh, nah. <laughs> and, no. And, and, and she said, okay, what about a lizard? And I, and then I thought I was being really smart. You know how you, your parent, parents think they're smarter than the kids, but the kids just never true. And I said, you know, no, I, okay, okay, I'll make a deal with you. If you can find one that doesn't get fed anything that is living, because I can't have any crickets or mice or anything else coming into this house. If you can find that, a vegetarian. <laughs> and and I, she did. And I, and I thought, I thought I'm so so brilliant because there's no such thing. <laughs> Guess you what? Know what my child went out and did? Guess what? A red Niger Euromastix. A vegetarian lizard. It's a lizard that eats it's a lizard that eats leathers. There you go. Now yeah. you got a lizard and three cats. <laughs> now we got a lizard. <laughs> um Maya, before we let you go, rank choice voting is the style this time around. Um, we've tried to cover it. It seems pretty yep. self-explanatory. Uh, are you, I mean, look, it's your reality as you run for the office of mayor um, and for the audience listening, ranked choice voting, you go in there, you pick your number one candidate, your number two candidate, your three, your four, your five candidate, and they keep counting until one of the candidates gets 50% of the votes, correct? Yeah, 50 plus one. Yep, that's correct. 50 plus so one. So if on, let, let me, 50 plus one. So meaning you got to get a majority of the vote. So here's the thing. I'm a big proponent fan 
of ranked choice voting, and I co-chaired the campaign to bring it to New York. And okay. let me tell you why. All right. Because I know there are concerns about it. I agree that we have to do a much better job than the Bureau of Elections is doing on voter on education on this. Education is a key. But let me tell you why. We have so many people running for office now, right? We got one race that's got 20 people, because it's not just mayor, it's also comptroller, Manhattan district attorney, city, city council, council members. Yeah. There are little council, hundreds of people are running for office right now. Uh, that means there's, you know, we could get runoffs. But here's the thing. Uh, now, the, the ranked choice voting apply, doesn't apply to every, so it doesn't apply to DA's race, for example. So that, that we want to make sure doesn't confuse people. But here's the thing. If it goes to a runoff election, if one candidate, look, because if one candidate gets 50% plus one, it's done. That's it. There's no, there's no going down to the next you know, level. But if there's a runoff, that means if we didn't have ranked choice voting, that would mean coming back to the polls a second time. Black people, Latinos, low-income people are much less likely to come back the second time. Mm. Our voting drops off. And as a civil rights lawyer, as a voting rights activist, I want to make sure our political voice is heard. So I work, so it is much simpler if people just come once to make sure our votes count, our voice gets heard, because we don't have to come back to the polls and give up a paycheck or hours of work or try to figure out how we're going to have childcare, who's going to take care of our elderly parent while we go stand in line at the polls. This is critically important for us to make sure our people are heard. So it is exactly as you said, Ebro, you're going to have up to five people to rank one, two, three, four, five in your order of preference. And my strong, and we're as a campaign are trying to help people understand this, fill out, don't put the same name five times mm. or two times or three times. Don't do that because they'll throw your ballot out. That's wow. the most important thing to understand. Do not, do not think, oh, great, I'm going to try to help my candidate by listing that person five times. No, you won't. your vote won't count. Mm. And you can, if you want, you don't have to put all five. You can do one person, you can put two persons, you can put three persons. I strongly, strongly, strongly recommend people list up to five because we don't know what will happen. And we don't want anyone's voice being diluted. And I say that, obviously, I want to be folks number one. But I care most about our people having a voice in deciding who leads us, right? So please, please, please do your homework and list five people because that's better for democracy, five different people. <laughs> and if anyone, if you hear any campaign saying, just put one name, just put me, I will tell you right now, as a racial justice activist, I am telling you that they are not putting the interests of the people first. Because mm. I'm going to tell you, put five people, five different people in the order you want them. Not because of me, but because I want your vo vote, your voice to count. That's the most important thing in our democracy, is that we all count and we all have a voice. This is Maya Wiley. Strong is very you make you make a strong case for yourself here. Maya Wiley's running for mayor <laughs> of New York City. Uh, ranked choice voting is how we got to do it this time. It was a pleasure to meet you. Thanks for coming on, Maya. Thanks, that was Maya. a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. And you didn't even ask me for my favorite hip hop artist. So nah, I don't well, we don't do that. We don't do all that pandering here. We don't do all <laughs> that. We gotta get to we gotta get to the real business. Oh, pandering. Now nah, later on, okay. later on, once. Well, it was a no, once we get once we get to know you, and you, if you get the job, then you're gonna be up here. and We're gonna do a whole a Maya Wiley mix, and we're gonna see what <laughs> records you pick. Gotcha. You know I'm with you. We All gotta right. do this go real work first. first. We I gotta do this work. real work first. There's some important <laughs> things going on. Thank you for your time today. Thanks, Maya. I'm with you. Thank you. Be take well. care. All right. Take care.